Today at Let's Talk Marketplace, we talk about how Temu is conquering the European market and why the European e-commerce desperately needs to wake up to this. Ed Sander, an expert analyst of the Chinese retail market, gives deep insights into the Timu business model and makes this an absolute must-listen episode. Have fun listening. Let's talk Marketplace. The Marketplace podcast with Ingrid Lommer and Valerie Dichtel. So, um, some figures to start with, because this is going to be interesting. We have been looking at Timu um, and Shein over the last uh, yeah, five, six months, I guess, here on Let's Talk Marketplace recently. But we have always been looking at it from a European point of view, as I say. So, some figures that I put together from that European point of view. So, um, for example, at the beginning of April, Timu placed some 8,000 new campaigns on Meta within one week. So um, far ahead of Shein and also even far further ahead of um, Amazon, for example. They only place about yeah, just a fraction of this ad volume, I would say. Um, and also, um, Timo has only been active in the German market for a year. Um, there has been a study recently by Opinio, um, and they said that one, around about one or four Germans, for example, um, have already shopped uh, with Timo. Uh, so that uh, is saying Germans between 16 and 65. So this is not just a young people's game. This is for interesting, for obviously, for everyone. And if that is true, that would bring um, Timo very close to the market share of, for example, Otto. Yeah, and uh, then there's, of course, the, the figures that the EU um, Commission published um, based on the Digital Markets Act, and they uh, found that uh, T, uh, Shimu and Tien together um, get some 180 million monthly EU users last year. That would be about the same amount as Amazon. Right, so these are the figures that we have been that have been circulating in the markets um, over the last month. And Ed, um, when I'm talking to European retail and e-commerce experts about Timu and Shin, I mostly get the sense of I don't know bafflement regarding the raging success of the Chinese <laughs> retailers. So why is the e European e-commerce so perplexed about this? Um, and should or could we have seen it coming much earlier? Okay, they're not going to like what I'm going to say right now. <laughs> so, um, I, I just did a keynote at uh, Bcom in Belgium, and I actually mm -hmm. told people um, that they have not been paying attention. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we know very little. We have very little attention for what is happening in the Chinese market. And mm -hmm. very few people know about, well, if you talk about Alibaba, uh, a lot of people... Uh, immediately think of AliExpress, but very few people know a lot about Taobao and about Tmall, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Few people know about Pinduoduo or what JD is doing. So we've, we've also always been very focused, of course, about what's happening in Silicon Valley and have paid n not enough attention to what's coming from China. Mm. And also we've not been paying attention to why these things are happening now. Um, I've been writing for about Pindodo for a long time. I wrote about uh, Timu because it was a Pindodo platform um, from as early as September 2022 when they launched. And I've continuously been writing about that. And especially for the, uh, basically until December last year, nobody was interested. Mm -hmm. Also, if you would talk to event organizers and say, guys, this is happening. This is coming your way. This is going to be a real threat they just said oh it's another aliexpress another light in the box uh, it's, it's not interesting <laughs> uh, half a year later I'm, i'm doing four keynotes in in one month and, mm -hmm. and a bunch of podcasts like this one and i basically speak to several um uh, journalists every week so people have woken up but really they've not been paying attention and that's why they are now sort of overwhelmed by what is happening Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, interesting. So maybe for us who have been sleeping, <laughs> not paying attention. But, but maybe um, not you guys, but like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, I do include myself, actually, because oh, yeah. I know we have been, I think the first time Valerie helped me out here, we've been talking about Timo was when they entered the European market about a year ago. And this is when we first had it on, on the news with us, of course. And we were, okay, well, this is Timo. Okay, they belong to Pindudo. Oh. Of course, mm -hmm. we knew that name. But. Um, um, as I, from what I gathered from um, the the industry and also from my own experience, was you looked at that new player and you went like, okay, that's like Alibaba, and Alibaba has not has been trying to enter the European market on and off again, and it wasn't, and we always got the sense that the Asian market is much more important for Alibaba, and they and Europe Europe would be something like a nice add on, but they're not really following sure. through. But of course, this is a very different story with Timo, obviously. So um, maybe uh, give us a short roundup. What has been happening in the last five years in China with these um, huge Chinese retail giant giants and their look on the European market that we have been missing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's completely correct what you said, that Alibaba Group had AliExpress, but it's never been like a very important priority for them because they were so focused on what was happening in the domestic market. And in hindsight, they now seeing the success of a Xi'an or a, and a Timu, mm. they realize that they actually dropped the ball and they've started reorganizing since, I think since 2022, got in some new management and they're trying again. And they are also mm. copying a lot of the business model and the learnings from Timu. So they are also starting to become a bit more like Timu in, in certain aspects. Um, what, what has been happening in the last five years um, in China? Well, of course, uh, as everywhere else, um, they had uh, three years of COVID. The, the country got locked down. Um, there was not an enormous n a number of very big trends. There was a lot of government crackdown on anti-monopoly behavior among some of these platforms, especially Alibaba. So they were very busy with that. And by the time that the country opened again and the lockdowns were ended in December 2022, everybody thought, okay, uh, this will be the time of what we call like revenge uh, consumption, right? Mm. Everybody can come out again and, and they will start spending. But actually the opposite happened. There's problems in the real estate sector. People have sort of lost trust because of all of the arbitrary decision making that they've gone through for three years. So they're, they're not sort of spending a lot. And this also was a, a, a great opportunity for Pintudo, which was already killing it in the Chinese market. But like I said, with the consumption downturn, people looking for less expensive goods, they only started growing and growing and growing at the expense of, of Alibaba and, uh, well, specifically Alibaba. So if you look, for instance, some a slide I showed at SCORE, and I will also show at K5, um, Alibaba had about 80% market share in 2013, and that will have shrunk to about one third of the market in um, in 2025. And they've lost this to Pintodo and to Douyin, which is basically the Chinese TikTok, because they have TikTok shop, uh, the version of that in, in China. So um, what has been happening more recently, specifically last year, is that platforms like JD... And Alibaba realized the threat of Pindodo and they've started to also focus more on low prices. So Alibaba has also started to move away from focus on, on the big brands and flagship stores on Tmall and, and turning more traffic towards Taobao because they can offer, uh, they have a lot of merchants that can offer lower prices there. JD has also opened up that platform much wider to have more merchants with low prices. So um Everybody is sort of trying to be more like Pindodo at the moment in, in China. So that's mm -hmm. probably the biggest thing that has been happening in the last five years. Mm -hmm. and, and when we talk about um, Timu and uh, Timu as a marketplace, um, how does that work right now? So we know, okay, we can order as end consumers at Timu. Mm -hmm. Can I also sell my products as a brand, as a European brand on Timu and um, um, sell it maybe like to like in Europe as well? Or like, how does that work right now? Or yeah. even does it make sense? Because we see also there's really like low prices on Timu. Like, does it make sense overall 
to use Tim as a marketplace for us? Or is it more like we shall learn from it? So that would be great to get more yeah, insights. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the, the first to first answer your question about Western brands selling on Timu, that's, that's something that Timu would like to move towards. Timu, at, at the end of the day, in a couple of years, they want to be more like Amazon. But they will go through a couple of different business models before they arrive there. So they might already start looking for Western brands that want to sell on their platform. But currently, just like with AliExpress, there will be very few brands that are interested because who wants to have their their, their carefully built up brand next to a lot of cheap Chinese junk, right? Mm, yes. that's, that's why why AliExpress also hasn't been very success, successful. Yeah. And for instance, in Spain have started uh, Miravia. Mm. Uh, to to have sort of more like a Tmall like platform and not yeah. a Taobao like platform. So um, then the question about a marketplace on Timu. Timu actually is not a marketplace as we know it. It, it has a very different model. Um, the model that they started with, they call the fully managed or the consignment model. So it basically means that um, Timu is selling these things on behalf of the factories where these products come from. They're not a reseller, so they don't, like, like in the original Amazon model, they don't buy and resell things. They're also not a marketplace because the factories cannot run their own stores and determine their own pricing. So the way this model works is, is basically like this. Uh, you have the factory, because most of the uh, middlemen have already been cut out because they cannot give the same low prices as the factories. You have Timu and you have the consumer. That's the three main parties uh, involved here, of course. Then uh, Pindodo already has contact with about 11 million factories that they use on the Pindodo platform in China. Just a they, few ones, yeah. Just a few. <laughs> but, and and what, what, what Timu does, they, they make a smaller selection of the, the factories that, according to them, can make export quality and can also produce uh, products that Western consumers might be interested in. So then what they do is they invite, basically, uh, it works two ways, of course. The factory can also say, can I sell on Artibo? But in the beginning, mostly they invited some of these factories to give their lowest price quote for these products. If Timu agrees with these prices, then the factory ships their products to a Timu warehouse, but the factory remains owner of those mm -hmm. products. Mm -hmm. So then... Timu uh, puts it on their website in their in uh, or on their app, and they start selling this product, and they determine the price. The factory has no say in what selling price Timu will be using. Then the consumer buys that online, then it gets shipped uh, to the consumer through, uh, especially in the beginning, through uh, uh, air shipment, like in, in big boxes, and those get sent uh, to the local couriers. And the couriers unpack these uh, boxes into separate individual uh, packages for consumers. Mm -hmm. um, and if that works, if a product is very popular, which Timu, of course, has all of the, the, the dials that they can turn to, to make a, a, a give, give a lot of traffic and sales to a product, then um, basically the uh, factory will continue to supply that product. If it's not, popular, then basically Timu will say to this manufacturer, okay, you can either pick up your goods or we'll scrap them or you will start uh, uh, paying uh, inventory costs. So that, that's basically how the model works. So it's not really a, um, a marketplace, but it's a consignment model, a fully managed model. Mm -hmm. Why do the factories do this? Why don't they just open up their own store on, on Amazon? Well, many of them have also an Amazon store. Mm -hmm. So that's why you find a lot of products on Amazon that you can also find on Timu. But there's also factories that have no experience in cross-border e-commerce. Mm -hmm. They have no staff that speak English. They have no staff that knows about Western consumption habits. So by simply having Timu select their products and do all of the sales for them on their behalf, the only thing that they need to do is what they are supposed to be best at, and that's making products. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the, the model that they started off with. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and that's also like, um, like 
when I remember what I t- said last year, also when like Timo came, I also think, I think I also said like, yeah, that's like, like the next AliExpress, who cares, like will come and will leave. Um, but if you say like, okay, they are like changing constantly their business model to become a Amazon-like uh, business, then that's much more interesting because right now, as far as I understood, yeah. I cannot, I can, as the end consumer, I can buy a Timo. And like they have like much cheaper prices because I mean if they ship it via air and then like just distribute it here in small parcels then um, yeah then they can also meet those prices because I always wondered like hey okay if I have like a product of like let's say five euros right from China with air with air freight it coming here it was like uh, how is this even possible right yeah. because even if I think about uh um um postal uh, fees right like a uh, porto and then i was like okay but if i have like already three euro 90 porto it's like that's like insane in, yeah. in in within germany not like not even talking about air freight and so on so um how does this work huh? yeah how yeah. does this work <laughs> yeah okay so, so the thing is that uh, there's a couple of things that are going on first of all if timu sees that a product is very popular and it's supplied by factory A, and they know that another factory can make exactly the same product, then they will also invite multiple other factories to bid on the volume that Timu can create. So give lower prices. So this this could mean that factory A already has its products in the Timu warehouse. And in this week, because this is something that happens on a weekly basis, factory B gives a lower price, then the sales of factory A will stop and the sales of factory B will start. Mm-hmm. The next week, the only thing that factory A can do is try to get under the price of factory B. Now, of course, this this has a potential th- uh, problem of the the product quality going down because manufacturers will try to uh, lower their manufacturing costs mostly by using cheaper raw materials. Um, so to sort of balance that out, Timo also has a penalty system that if a customer complains... And you might not think so, but basically on on Timu, they have a system that the customer is always right. Then the customer will either get their money back immediately or will have to send back the the goods and get their money back uh, as soon as the package, the the return package has arrived in the return depot. Um, And then the manufacturer has to pay five times the sales price, not his manufacturing sales price, but the consumer sales price as a penalty. Mm-hmm. So they're trying to balance out low price and quality this way. And and anybody that has ordered a lot of stuff on Timo will know that they haven't found, quite found the balance yet because there's <laughs> yeah. still too much low quality product. So that's one way how they pressure down the basically the, the, um, the manufacturing price. Mm-hmm. Then, like I said, they determine the sales price. Now, what they do in the beginning is they heavily subsidize that. Now, if you talk about subsidies, people normally immediately start thinking about the Chinese government. But as a matter of fact, what these uh, what Timu is doing is they p- are paying part of the price that they would need to uh, sell it for if it would be profitable. Mm-hmm. So they subsidize these prices. The the, the packaging costs and logistical costs uh, are about ten euro to to get it to the consumer in Europe. So mm-hmm. at the end of the day, they are still losing money. Um, mm. If you look at the results, the Timu results of last year, they had about a, a net uh, or a loss of uh, 27%. Mm. They are trying to bring this to 18% and be uh, this year and be uh, break even next sometime next year. So how, how do they do that? So they are making, they are not making any money on these uh, products at the moment. And the factories are making a little bit of margin still if they're, if they're lucky. So, what they're going to do is as soon as people have built sort of the habit of buying on Timu because of the low prices, they will start raising the price bit by bit until you pay roughly the same as what you will pay on Shein as well, because Shein also has a marketplace. Mm-hmm. And what they're aiming for is they're aiming for a price that is about 70% of what you would buy it for on Amazon. Uh, what they also do at the same time is they will increase the minimum order value that you have to buy. Um, so if you're a new customer, you will get free shipping and it doesn't matter how many products you buy. But if you've been ordering a couple of times, you'll see that is, for instance, 20 euro. You have to buy at least 20 euros. 
So that's why how they uh, slowly move towards profitability. Mm -hmm. A third thing that they will do is uh, they have that fully managed model. But of course, as we discussed, the logistical costs of that are extremely high. So they are also allowing now certain uh, manufacturers and merchants to also ship the goods mostly by boat or maybe by train, which is now also possible um, with the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, ship it to the region of destination, put it in a warehouse there, and also arrange the logistic with local couriers. But team will still be the one that is selling and setting the price, but the mm -hmm. manufacturer will get a bit more margin. But thereby, Timu will bring down their uh, logistical costs at the same time. Now, the, 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 the scary thing, the most scary thing about this is that, of course, if you sell everything and ship it by airplanes, then it has to fit in a small package. package. Hmm. But if you actually ship from local warehouses in this hmm. new model, which is called the semi-managed model, in this new model... You can also start selling refrigerators. You can sell furniture. Mm. You can sell big, heavy, yeah, heavy bulky, bulky products. stuff. Mm. So that's what what Timu will be moving towards uh, this year as well. Mm. So they they have the fully managed, they have the semi managed, and they want to uh, want to move towards more like uh, a model where they don't manage anything and they have more like a marketplace model like Amazon. And there's probably then they keep these three different flavors that merchants can choose from based on their own situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's that's basically what's going to happen. That's an insane, unsustainable business model, right? Yeah, and that's that's what I was going for as a next question, because what I uh, gather from people looking at what the team was doing in Europe, um, I think a lot of... Um, e-commerce experts here are sort of hoping and waiting for the moment that the team was going to run out of money. I mean, how much is Pinduoduo willing to invest in this? Because we have these huge um, logistic costs that they are producing, as you just explained. Mm -hmm. um, we have also a huge amount of, of um, marketing spend that they are pushing into it. And um, there were some reports last year, for example, that Timo has been decreasing their ad spend in several European countries and just last week I read that um, Timo is now um, giving customers an, an option for a slow delivery via land instead of air freight um, also offering financial incentives of course um, and at the same time increasing the minimum order limits for air freight as you just said so is cost an issue for Timo and are these hopes of um, European e-commerce participants that um, Pinduoduo might just run out of money any valid? Well, again, I'm, I'm apologizing for bursting their bubble. <laughs> um, so to start off with uh, uh, the question, how much is Pinduoduo willing to spend on this? Mm -hmm. And you actually have to realize why they are doing this. And they are doing this because in the, the domestic market in China, They basically cannot grow anymore as far as, as uh, buying customers is concerned because they mm -hmm. already have more than 800 million Chinese people on Pintodo. Uh, and there's only about 1 billion uh, Chinese people online. So it's, it's very difficult to get that remaining uh, 20%. Mm. Um, and that's why they started Timu because they want to grow... Um, faster than only in the, the Chinese market. Now, in the Chinese market, like I said, you have the consumption downgrade. So actually, they've been doing incredibly well in the last couple of years at the expenses of uh, companies like Alibaba Group. Mm. And their cash reserves are enormous. So basically, what they're doing now is they're buying market share all around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so people that say this cannot be uh, sustainable, this cannot be profitable, of course not, because it's a phase where they're buying themselves into the market. And mm -hmm. as far as we can see, it's they're doing really well um, as uh, for, mm -hmm. with that KPI. Um, and like I said, they will change some of the uh, they they will change some of the dials and they will change the model until this whole thing will become profitable. Now, as far as the question is concerned about their ad spending, that is also entering a new phase because in the in the start, what they do is they spend enormous amounts of money on 
uh, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram, on Google to get people to know the brand, download the app and start buying. Mm -hmm. uh, they also, which, which you don't see, is the part that they subsidize in the prices, which will also go down. So what in many countries, they have now reached a phase where uh, most of the people already have the app. So they're not doing as much customer acquisition anymore as they used to do. And that's why you see their marketing budget go down. Um, it will overall, uh, globally, will stay the same. It was $3 billion last year, $3 billion. It will also be $3 billion this year, but they have opened up new markets. So in the markets where they are already uh, active, they will be decreasing and it will go in waves but mm -hmm. because they will keep twisting those dials depending on what they're trying to accomplish. But overall, the marketing spend will go down, but the marketing budget will stay the same because they're moving into a retention phase where they're trying to get people to buy, continue buying on the app. So that's not so much done by advertising, but by giving all kinds of discounts and subsidies in the app. So, mm -hmm. and that's the thing that you, of course, don't see. So it looks like they're, they're dialing down, but they're simply shifting budgets towards uh, new goals. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, if, if you're talking about, you know, I, I mean, this is really something I'm just put, putting all these arguments that I get mm -hmm. from the market to you because people are saying, yeah, they're going to run out of money or uh, people are not interested in that kind of thing. Yeah, of course they are, obviously. Um, and the other thing that um, I keep hearing, and I'm sure you will sh shoot this down very quickly as well, um, is uh, are legal options for European countries. I mean, there are mm -hmm. several European countries pushing for legal registration on uh, Timor imports in some form, um, maybe via taxes, like South Africa has now applied, higher taxes for um, imports by Timor, or higher logistic fees, or a stronger control regarding um, European regula regulation law laws, which um, Timor products are um, frequently breaking, of course. So what do you think about that? Do um, countries have legal options to deal yeah. with um, Timor and will that make any kind of impact? Yeah, like f first of all, like you said, unfortunately, people keep buying this rubbish. <laughs> uh, again, it's not, I mean, I, I bought about 20 articles myself by now on Timu, and, and about uh, maybe eight were, were not good, but there were also mm. some very good products in there. Mm. So that's, that's something that they definitely should uh, figure out how to do better. Um, but people keep buying this because, and, and that's cheap. like like I also said at SCORE and at K5, um, uh, we have this consumption habit and this dopamine rush when when we see a, a deal and we cannot, we, we want to buy it. It's basically shopping on Timu is the same as walking into an action store. Mm. Um, and you also buy all kinds of things that you really don't need, but, but it's so cheap that you you cannot help yourself. You can't resist, so, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's one of the big problems. So the problem is not just the, the Chinese web shops, it's also our consumption behavior. But if we look at, at the web shops and themselves, um, if we compare it, for instance, to TikTok shop, a TikTok shop in uh, the US is very focused on compliance because TikTok by itself, the video app is already under a magnifying glass. Huh? Mm -hmm. So so they're very careful with everything they do. and. If you talk to people from ByteDance, the company behind um, behind TikTok and Douyin in China, they say, well, we, we try to be very careful, but what Timu is doing is getting on the bus and buying the ticket later. Mm -hmm. So that means that they set up the website, they set up the payment systems, the logistics, uh, the whole supply chain, and they will worry about playing by the rules later on. They will buy mm -hmm. that ticket later. And that is some, something that, of course, is very threatening because a lot uh, of... Yadi, low quality and even dangerous goods are entering our markets, which is, a, mm. as far as I'm concerned, is a real, real big problem. And we cannot deal with this because uh, all of the custom uh, organizations, they, they don't have the staff to, to mm. check every package, right? So how, how are you going to do this? So I completely agree that we need to find a, a solution for this. Uh, it's got to be a real challenge. Banning a platform outright um, is maybe a bit too far. I think you should st you should first figure out something else because at the end of the day, we, we live in an open market economy. So mm -hmm. we, we, we shouldn't discriminate. There should be a level playing field, but a level playing field is a level playing field for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. For mm -hmm. our companies and for the Chinese companies. Um, if you look at their marketing tricks, 
Uh, something that I also often say is they're really not doing anything that we haven't done before. Mm. Um, so th they are subsidizing these prizes instead of giving a very clear, transparent discount. So this, you could say that this is probably unethical, but I used to work for an, an office supply company that used to do exactly the same thing. They send prospects a catalog with, with prices that were heavily discounted without the customer knowing. And as soon as they started buying, then they would get the regular the catalog with the regular higher prices. Mm. So we've been fooling, and I'm, I'm not specifically talking about me or, or, or you ladies, but we have also pulled all kinds of marketing tricks. And of course, we mm. have become more critical about that. And we should be as critical um, as we are to ourselves and with our own legislation to uh, companies like Timu as well. But at the same time, if you look at Booking.com is doing the same tricks. We mm -hmm. only have two hotel rooms left. Uh, buy <laughs> within a certain couple of minutes, et cetera, et cetera. Those kinds of tricks. You see team using these same tricks. If that is not according to our legislation, they should be fined or punished uh, in, in some way. What is happening at the same time is now that they go into this new phase, they are, try they are spending more uh, people and staff on compliance. So we just need to keep pushing them to comply. Um, but if we just want to ban them because they're like uh, a very annoying new competitor from China, that for me is not reason enough. No. Uh, so so I think we will, we, we will have to assume that they will start playing by the rules better um, and that they are just a part of new the new reality. And Something I always also say is that if you look at what happened in China when Pindodo started, all of the Chinese internet platforms laughed at them. They said, oh, this is a business model. It's never going to work. Nobody's going to buy mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that rubbish. And then people started doing that. <laughs> and then uh, within a couple of years, Pindodo IPO'd that had taken all of the other companies much longer to do. Mm. And then they actually thought, oh, well, well, maybe we should pay attention to what's happening here. And they started studying Pindodo. And now... They are trying to become more like Pindodo. So first they laughed, then they studied, and now they want to be Pindodo. So the reason that I say that is, is we should definitely not think, we should not underestimate these guys mm. and what they're capable of. Mm. And, and back to the uh, cash reserves that they have, even though, though they are spending so much money on Timu, their cash reserves in China are still rising because they're doing so well inside China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So to sum this up, um, they're not going to run out of money. <laughs> Customers are not going to stop buying that stuff because it's so cheap and nice and um, fills all our dopamine levels to a high extent. And um, Timo is probably not going away in Europe and uh, regulations and laws and whatever might help a little bit to even the playing field, but that might take quite a while. So... What do we do? What do brands and retailers then do with this new competitor? How do we deal with them? Well, it depends a bit on what you're currently doing. Um, I think if you're a drop shipment company, uh, it will be very difficult mm. to compete with Timu because you're basically just an additional middleman that's not necessary in the Timu model because Timu is that only middleman in 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 their uh, mm. basically whole chain. So uh, that's probably the first ones that will will disappear. If you're doing nothing more than shipping a package or not even doing that yourself, but uh, you're not adding any value, you're simply moving boxes, so to speak, then I, I, I see a very dark uh, future for you. Also because, well, uh, like I said, AliExpress is rejuvenating their business. TikTok shop might be coming <clears throat> in a few months. Yeah, but so to, to be fair, those those box movers already had a bad lookout on the future ever since mm. um, Amazon started FBA, I would say. Correct. Yeah, that's oh. true. Yeah. Um, and then, so so there's more and more like uh, of these companies coming our way. Mm -hmm. So if if we do, if if we try to compete on just price, we're not going to win that because mm -hmm. the Chinese companies, because of their integration with the supply chain will always do better on price. So we have to be better on quality. We have to be better on unique products that people are also willing to pay for. We have to be better on service. And that's, of course, we have to be better on the difficult part 
of e-commerce, right? Um, if if I, for instance, look here in the in the Netherlands, I don't know if you're familiar with Cool Blue. Yes. Yes. Now, Cool Blue, they're they're not the best as far as price is concerned, but they have so much advice and service and they help you pick the right products and if you have a problem then they they don't make a big deal and they they help you out it's things like these that will probably protect them for for the time being but if you're simply uh just moving a product um without adding anything else then i think it could be quite a difficult future Mm -hmm. right I did want to end this episode on a more lighter note, you know, I tried. <laughs> let's, get back to, let's get back to Chinese food. Yeah, <laughs> Chinese food, very good idea. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I really didn't want to depress everybody that is listening to this. But but like I said also in, in the keynotes, we, we have not been paying attention and it's yeah. really time that we wake up. Mm-hmm. Right, okay. Valerie, any more questions or are you... Yeah, plenty, but not more time. <laughs> not huh? more time. Yeah, that's the problem. So maybe we set up a new one up with you, Ed. Yeah, no yeah, we might um, have to do part two on this. Maybe part two half or, a year or about something. Shein, to be very honest. That's or also what Shein. I thought. Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. that would be interesting. Yeah, they're working on their IPO. So that's also going to be... Uh, yeah. uh, so I'm one of the reasons, by the way, uh, why they are, are pushing their IPO and maybe doing that in London is the competition with Timu because mm-hmm. currently it's it's the, the 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 parties that are competing most with each other at this moment is the Chinese companies the Chinese platforms among, among themselves among each other yeah. yeah yeah that might be <laughs> in the end one of the saviors might be um, mm. another asian company that is uh, keeping Timu in check correct yeah Anyway, right. So, Ed, thanks you, thank you very, very much for your insights. That was very, very, very enlightening. Um, not always very optimistic, but very enlightening nonetheless. And um, I hope all of our listeners are now set up for future Timo discussions and are in the in the state of waking up, as uh, Ed said several times now, because I think it's high time. I, for my part, have learned a lot. What about you, Valerie? Definitely. I mean, I got like a first intro, intro already at the score, mm-hmm. maybe next week at K5 again. Um, and um, this was also, yeah, quite enlightful and um, yeah, woke woke up definitely more up. So um, <laughs> thank you for the insights, Ed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, maybe, maybe I can give two more suggestions uh, yes. to, to, to wake up and stay awake. Um, like we discussed, I write these really in-depth reports for Tech Boss China. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I think I, I send send you uh, a couple of these reports as examples. Uh, it's not it's not free. It's a paid newsletter, but we do these uh, reports that have lots of detail that you won't find anywhere else. So we don't just do them about e-commerce, but also about uh, electric vehicles, uh, apps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm-hmm. So uh, Tech Boss China, if people really want to. Uh, keep an eye on what's happening in in, in China. That's something that uh, I would definitely recommend them to check out. Another thing is, and I can probably say that by now because K5 has already happened, is well, one of the study tours that I'm doing, we're going to do together with K5. Mm-hmm. So oh, wow. people that, uh, that are listening and are interested in coming along can actually join that, uh, that tour and it will be a combination of masterclasses that that me and the other guys that, that are the other experts that are joining will be doing in the morning and actually going to places to experience a lot of this Chinese e-commerce innovation themselves. Mm-hmm. So do keep an eye uh, for, out for that as well. Mm-hmm. That sounds interesting. When That's... do you do this? <laughs> we will do this, uh, I don't know the exact date, but it, I think it's the last week of October. So it's, uh, it's the last week of, to- of October that runs into November. Okay. okay. And we what will we already announce planning? it next, <laughs> next Tuesday. So. Mm-hmm. Great. Okay. We'll definitely have a look out for that one. Yeah. Right. So, bye-bye. Bye-bye. You listen to Let's Talk Marketplace. The Marketplace podcast with Ingrid Lommer and Valerie Dichtel.